This is The Thriving Dentist Show with Gary Takas, where we help you develop your ideal dental practice, one that provides personal, professional, and financial satisfaction. Welcome to another episode of The Thriving Dentist Show. I'm Gary Takas, your podcast co-host. This episode is titled, An Effective Way to Increase Your Case Acceptance of Ideal Care. Well, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Uh, I'm going to go into some details uh, about how you can make some subtle shifts to help your patient patients take a greater interest in in ideal care. Uh, so you get to um, do more of that uh, kind of dentistry that you might like to do more of. Uh, before I get to that, though, just one quick announcement today. Uh, in our top clinical tip, we have a new contributor. Uh, this is Dr. Edward Feinberg. Uh, he's a practicing dentist in New York. Uh, And he is going to talk about emergency crown restorations. This is part one. There actually will be others in this series, but this is part one. Uh, And you're going to hear the audio of that in just a minute. But if you, he also recorded it by video. And there's a couple of different ways to get the video. I think you might appreciate seeing the video. Uh, You can go to uh, uh, thrivingdentist.com, click the podcast, scroll down to this episode, and you'll see a link in the show notes, and the link will take you to that video. The other way you could go is just go uh, type in uh, Thriving Dentist YouTube channel in Google, and up will come our YouTube channel. And you'll also see uh, Dr. Feinberg's video in the YouTube channel as well. And you'll see all the other uh, guest contributors that have produced their segments in video. Lots of cool video content available there. And I think you'll like the price of it uh, very well. There's no cost, of course, to our YouTube channel uh, and lots of really cool practical clinical advice uh, covering just about every type of dentistry. So if you haven't already discovered our YouTube channel, uh, there it is. Uh, Click subscribe. Uh, That helps us and helps more dentists find us. So click subscribe. It's free uh, and you can have access to some free uh, clinical uh, tips uh, for sure. With no further ado, here's Dr. Edward Feinberg on emergency crown restoration, part one. Hi, everyone. I have a clinical tip for you that's going to turn that emergency nightmare into a piece of cake. What is the emergency? My crown broke off at the gum line. How are you going to have this patient walk out with a tooth? That's a big problem for a lot of people. It might shock you to know that it's not a difficult thing. I made a temporary for this patient within 45 minutes. And uh, the endodontist went through the temporary in order to do the endodontics. And I didn't build it up. And I didn't do fancy extrusion. And I didn't do extensive crown lengthening. And I didn't put a post in it. How did I do it? Well, I have a different philosophical approach than what is taught in the dental schools. And uh, their ideas are very limiting, so that's why most people think it's impossible. But I am the heir to a long tradition that goes back to dentistry's roots. Uh, My father was a master and pioneer in full mouth reconstruction and full coverage restorative dentistry. And his name was Dr. Elliot Feinberg. And he had an amazing mentor, Dr. I. Franklin Miller. So together, my dad and I have amassed a collection of more than 100,000 pictures of crown and bridge cases that that go back to 1950. All the teeth prepared and handled the same way according to the same basic principles. And the cases followed four decades with x-rays. This is a real rarity in dentistry. And you could see here, prior to 2004, all the pictures were slides. And after 2004, they were all digital. So before I even joined my father in practice, he had boxes full of these copper-plated dyes that he had done. And I did epoxy dyes for the entire career. And I have a box full of these teeth, all flush with the gingiva. And you could see here, no posts, no buildups, no nothing. And the only way you can really do that is with copper bands. And most people, when they think of copper bands, they think of copper band impressions. But copper bands can also be used for temporaries. And I use copper bands when there's little or no clinical crown, obviously, when a post hole cannot or should not be created. And in my opinion, I I think posts are, are harmful and a waste of time and should be completely discontinued. 
Um, when there's a weak post that could be easily dislodged, you might as well give yourself a, a, a break and make a temporary with a copper band. When a tooth is prone to fracture, I'm going to make a temporary with a copper band. And when temporaries must be worn for a long period of time, because they seal the teeth like mason jar covers, just like the permanent ones do, and uh, they are likely to last a long time without recurrent decay. And copper has, offers tremendous advantages in that it's extremely antibacterial. They did studies on copper and they found zero uh, colonies of bacteria, whereas stainless steel actually had bacterial colonies on it. And so it suggested that perhaps all the implements in hospitals should be made out of copper rather than stainless steel. <clears throat> so there's different places and uh, you can get copper bands. Um, and they come in different sizes. The old copper bands weren't annealed, meaning they were very, very difficult to work with. Um, in fact, you couldn't work with them at all. Whereas the ones that are pre-annealed are malleable and you can form them to the tooth surface. So if you have copper bands that are not annealed, you have to anneal them first before you can use them. And it's very simple. You take your copper band and you heat it up in a Bunsen burner until it glows cherry red, and then you quench it in a bowl of water quickly. This takes seconds. Um, annealing will make the band turn dull brown, and then it'll become very malleable. So when I make take impressions with copper bands, I take an impression of the entire root surface. So now when I'm going to make a copper band temporary, I want to take advantage of the entire root surface below the gingiva. And most people are not doing this. They're not used to working below the gingiva. These are touted as good impressions and from a magazine. I would never accept them. An inadequate grip on the root, inadequate seal of margins. The copper band technique offers you the entire root surface. I hope one day they're going to invent some kind of CBCT scan that will register an impression of the entire root surface below the gingiva. And I think that may be coming one day and that would revolutionize everything. Okay, let's conclude part one here. Until next time, thank you and see you. Welcome back to the Thriving Dentist Coaching in Action segment. This is Narain, your co-host. I want to take a minute to thank Dr. Feinberg for that wonderful tip, Emergency Crown Restoration Part 1. You can check it out on our YouTube channel, on our show notes page. Hopefully you get value from it. Watch the video. You would love it. Let's dive into today's topic, an effective way to increase your case acceptance of ideal care, an effective way to increase your case acceptance of ideal care. Gary has taught me this, uh, I guess, going back to the very first day I met him. There is, you know, uh, ideal care and then what a lot of dentists are settling for. I remember recently in our um, um, summit, the RIDA summit, uh, we had somebody from Dental Intel and he was sharing some stats. And one of the stats that he shared with me that just blew me away is post-pandemic, the average dentistry a, a doctor is presenting to their patient has come down significantly, almost half. So they're not presenting ideal care. It's almost like they're afraid of presenting ideal care. So I felt this topic is going to be so timely, an effective way to increase your case acceptance of ideal care. Gary, take it away. Naren, I've encountered this many times in my coaching work where, uh, you know, think about human nature. If you keep banging your head against the wall, at some point, you're going to say, you know what, that's not fun banging my head against the wall. I'm going to stop doing that. Yes. <laughs> and the dental analogy to that is if I'm presenting ideal care to patients and they keep saying, no, not interested. What's the byproduct of that? The byproduct of that is at some point you figure nobody's interested in this, so I'm not going to present it. Uh, and pretty soon it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that mm -hmm. you end up presenting necessary care only it, it, you know, instead of the full range of services that you're perhaps able to you know, to help patients with. <clears throat> and I think one of the biggest challenges that the dentists experience, and I've heard this, you know, qu quite literally thousands of times from dentists. Uh, I've heard dentists say to me, Gary, one of my biggest challenges is when I have a patient that has a lot going on in their mouth, but nothing hurts. There's a lot going on in their mouth, but nothing hurts. 
how do I know whether I should present comprehensive care or just present something more basic? How do I know? How do I know? Uh, and if you're listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, that's something I encounter, if not every day, it's something I encounter probably every week. How do you know? Um, and I'm going to share with you a way to navigate that that involves your patient. It's a co-discovery. Um, some of you uh, may know that I do a co-discovery workshop with my good friend, Dr. Paul Henney. Um, it's a two-day uh, workshop that we do at his learning center in Virginia, uh, where we talk about um, the whole concept of co-discovery. Co-discovery means that together, you and the patient co-discover what's going on in their mouth, what's going on in their mouth. And then you co-discover the challenges that have created what's created the problems in their mouth. And you co-discover the solutions that that's going to lead them to better oral health. And now the patient is a participating, you know, entity there. Uh, they're participating in the process uh, and they're much like more likely to have a greater interest in ideal care. And this is especially useful. Um, certainly patients of any age. Uh, could be a potential candidate for, for complex uh, restorative care. That could be someone in their early 20s, depending on you know what caused the, the problems. But as your patient base ages, this is something much more common as we get to middle age and older, that uh, there could be patients that could really benefit through ideal care. Um, and before I get into the specific um, tips that I'm going to offer on this, I want to do some benchmarking for you. And the benchmarking here is around case acceptance. And I'm going to give you three different categories to start measuring case acceptance because they're the three common categories we see in any dental practice. And category number one, um, you know, would be uh, urgent care would be there's something going on in the patient's mouth that hurts and, and they require a solution for it. Um, Naren, let's just say hypothetically, the patient is, their cheek is swollen out. Um, they haven't slept in the last three nights and they're in your office as an emergency patient. Uh, once we determine what's going on and we present that to the patient, Naren, what should our case acceptance goal be uh, for symptomatic meaning pain care? What should case acceptance be? 30%? 100%. 100%. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like uh, necessary care. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Naren, you um, haven't slept yeah. for three nights. Tears are rolling down <laughs> your cheeks. Would you like that to stop hurting? <laughs> the answer is yes. That's yes, why I'm yes, here. yes, yes. I'm sorry. I was thinking. 100%. 100. Anything less than 100% on that case? Well, I'll let you complete that sentence. All right. But we should have 100%. Now, unfortunately, or well, humanistically, fortunately, not everyone shows up to your office in pain. Right, right. I'm going to say this playfully. I know you guys know me well enough to know this is playful. I kind of wish it was in pain because if it was in pain, you'd have 100% case acceptance. But much of the dentistry that we do or have the capability of doing the ways of helping people, it's asymptomatic. It doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to everyday general dentistry, I'm talking about everyday stuff, fillings, root canals, crowns, everyday general dentistry for asymptomatic dentistry. My benchmark for that is 70% or above for everyday general dentistry. Typically, that's stuff covered by insurance. You know, if you're in insurance practice, insurance covers it uh, or covers it at some level. For everyday general dentistry, that's asymptomatic. Doesn't hurt. If it hurts, it's 100%. If it doesn't hurt, we're shooting for 70%. Naren, how do you feel about that number? Does that number seem uh, realistic to you? You see, you see us measuring it with our clients. What do yeah, you think? Yeah, the 70% number. Um... I think many of your clients do achieve it, Gary. So absolutely, it has to be realistic. Otherwise, they won't it's be. It's been done it. before. It must be possible, right? Yes. yes. Now let's go to comprehensive or ideal care. We're in a whole different world over here. Comprehensive or ideal care. Typically, it doesn't hurt. Typically, it doesn't hurt. And it's something that's been going on for a long time. Let, let me describe a situation that all of our listeners can identify with because you see it, if not daily, uh, you see it every week. A new patient comes in with severely worn dentition. This is typically an older patient, might be uh, 50 plus years old, maybe 60 plus years old. And they have little tiny nubby teeth that they have worn down to where they're 
maybe half the size of what they used to be when they were younger or even less. But guess what, Marin? It doesn't hurt. It right. doesn't hurt. What should your case acceptance be for comprehensive or ideal care? All right, I'm going to give you this. Between 30 and 40%, 30 and 40%. Now, let me uh, give you a way to look at that. Uh, I happen to have grown up in a baseball family, in a baseball family. In fact, my youngest brother uh, played in the Little League World Series. Um, they, they played in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Um, they won the U.S. championship and they lost to Taiwan, seven to one. So uh, they didn't win the world championship, but they won the national championship. So I grew up in a baseball family. Let me give you a baseball analogy. Darren, I, I know that uh, north of the border, you guys don't pay as much attention to baseball as you do to hockey. Um, you pay a lot of attention to hockey. Uh, but in baseball, if a um, major league baseball player has a lifetime batting average of, say, 350, lifetime batting average, there is a term that we could use that we could label that person. What would that term be? And if you don't get it, you can call a friend there and I'll be your friend. What's that term? Hall of Famer. Hall of Famer. You got it. Hall of Famer. They're a Hall of Famer. If you have a lifetime batting average of 350, you are a Hall of Famer. You will make the Hall of Fame uh, in, in the first round. Uh, very few uh, Major League Baseball players have achieved that standard. Uh, so what does that mean? That means you got to hit 35% of the time. That's what a 350 batting average. That means you didn't get a hit. You know, the, the opposite of that. 65% uh, of the time, you didn't get a hit. But that player is still considered a Hall of Famer. Well, I'd like to think that all of our listeners, Naren, of The Thriving Dentist Show are Hall of Famer dentists. By virtue of the fact that they are committing themselves to learning more by listening to the podcast, I think that makes them a Hall of Famer or a potential Hall of Famer. Wouldn't you agree? Agreed. So... Using that same analogy, anytime we're between 30 and 40%, we'll present ideal care and the patient says, yeah, let's do it. Let's get started on this. Let's go. Uh, then that's a benchmark we're striving for between 30 and 40% case acceptance on ideal care. Now, if you're not measuring your case acceptance, you have no idea how you're doing. Uh, so I might, I might suggest that you start measuring it uh, because uh, it's, it's been said uh, by Peter Drucker, uh, the founder of the science of business management, uh, two things he said about measuring. Number one, things that are measured improve. Things that are measured improve. Do you believe that, Naren? Absolutely. If you don't measure it, I mean, there's no way. It's like, uh, you know, you have no leg to stand on. There's nothing to improve on because, you know, you don't know what you don't you're, know doing. How you're doing. Yeah. It's, it's like, all... I, it's all a happy accident, all yeah. just, or a sad yeah. accident. Either way, it could go either way. Yeah. Um, the other thing Peter Drucker said is you, you can't manage what you don't measure. And doctors that don't measure their case acceptance will typically respond, hey, George, how do you think you're doing with case acceptance? Or uh, Dr. Maria, how do you think you're doing with, with case acceptance? They'll usually answer that question anecdotally. Uh, Dr. Maria might say, well, Gary, I had two new patients today. Both of them needed treatment and both of them scheduled for it. So I think I'm doing pretty well. Or conversely, Dr. Maria might say, Gary, I had two new patients today. Both of them needed treatment, treatment that is absolutely in our practice wheelhouse, and neither one of them scheduled. I don't think I'm doing very well. So neither one of those perceptions is accurate because it's the uh, it's it's called immediacy and recency. The, the concept in psychology of immediacy, immediacy and recency means we remember what happened most recent. Disproportionately, we're, we're, it's always this or it's always that. Oh, well, mm -hmm. they, we had two patients today and they accepted, so we're doing great. Oh, we had two patients today, neither one of them scheduled, so we're doing horrible. Neither one of those is accurate. It's not a long enough lens to look at. So start measuring this. All right, now I want to share with you. So that was kind of a, a way to get into looking at some data. Uh, and looking at how you might improve. And, and remember what Peter Drucker said, things that are measured improve and you can't manage what you don't measure. With that in mind, let me share a, a simple tip for you. I need to kind of set it up. Let's assume that it's an older patient, uh, someone say 60 years old or older, and I'm just randomly picking a number there. And there's a lot going on in that patient's mouth. Clearly, over time, a lot of things had a lot of different dentistry has been done. There's a lot of things going on in the mouth. 
Nothing hurts, nothing hurts, but clearly that patient could benefit from some complex restorative dentistry. Naren, you've worked with a lot of practices. What I'm describing is something that I think is not uncommon but for any of our listeners. Would you agree? Agreed. Yeah. So now, uh, doctor, and, and now imagine that because you're a relationship, I'm going to weave some concepts together here. So now we have the patient, a lot going on in their mouth, but nothing hurts. And now because we're a relationship-driven practice, even as a new patient, we know a little bit about that patient because that's part of the new patient experience. We mm -hmm. know a little bit about them. And let's just say hypothetically that your patient, George, I'll use George as the name, the fictitious name in this example. Let's just say that he's recently moved to the area to be closer to his grandkids. And that came up in the, in the discussion. That's why he's a new patient in your practice because he moved to the area and found your practice. Again, I'm just making up an example. So now put those two concepts together. Here's George. 60 plus, a lot going on in his mouth, nothing hurts. And he's recently moved to the area to be closer to the grandkids. So now doctor is going to say something like this. Um, you know, George, it's been great to meet you today. I sure appreciate you choosing our office for your care. We're going to, we're going to work hard to take great care of you. You know, we've taken some records today. Um, we've taken some x-rays. We've taken some uh, images. Um, uh, we've taken some three-dimensional images as well. And I've also had a chance to talk to you about kind of a little bit about your dental history. Now, it's apparent to me, and likely to you too as well, George, that there's a lot going on in your mouth. But before I present a treatment plan, I'd like to ask you a question. Is that okay? And yes. what's George going to say? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to apply the information that he just gave. Uh, George, um, you, you mentioned that you've recently moved to our area to be closer to your grandchildren. Now, it's been a while since I've moved. But I remember the last time I moved, there were a lot of moving pieces in my life. Uh, and so the question I have for you, um, in light of the fact that there's a lot going on in your mouth, is now the right time to address the solutions ideally to, to get you an ideal oral health, you know, especially given, given the, the timing and given the fact that, hey, you've recently moved here, is now the right time to address these conditions ideally? And then I shut up and listen, is now the right time. And it could be, you know, again, another example, let's say it's a younger patient. Uh, you know, Bob, um, you mentioned that you just started a new job. It, it's been a long time since I started a new job, but I remember the last time I did, there were a lot of things going on right now. Is in light of the fact that you started a new job, is now the right time to address these conditions ideally? Another example, um, Linda, you mentioned that you have two kids in college. I remember when we had kids in college and, and, you know, how much of a challenge that was in the household budget, you know, with two kids in college is now the right time to address what's going on in your mouth, ideally. Now, what might the patient say, Darren? What might the patient say? Any of those examples? They could say, you know what, this is the right time. Oh, no, you are correct. You know, there's a few other things going on in my life. Yeah. Why don't we? They could say, yeah, that's why months. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. You know. They could say, yeah, that's, that's exactly why I'm here. Um, or, you know, let's go back to my first example, George, the 60 year old, lots going on in his mouth. Um, George might say, well, as a matter of fact, we do, we are up to our eyebrows uh, with this move and, and lots of things happening. Here's what I'm going to go if the answer is no. If the answer is yes, then we present optimal care. If the answer is no, which is another possibility, we say, George, totally understand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break down your treatment plan into two categories. First category is going to be necessary dentistry, like things that need to be done right now that does, you know, that that involve disease and decay. Um, and and then I'm going to uh, work up a treatment plan for you to how to how to address these concerns ideally. One thing I would like to have from you is your commitment to uh, regularly scheduled hygiene appointments. Regularly scheduled hygiene appointments. Uh, George, you have healthy gums. We, we had a chance to evaluate that. You have healthy gums. That means that we'd like to see you every six months. And I'd like your commitment to, uh, you know, keeping those hygiene appointments every six months, because then I'll have a ch chance every time um, to visit with you during those hygiene appointments to do a quick exam to kind of give you a status report on what's going on. And then we'll be ready to do this when you are. We'll be ready when you are. George, how does that sound to you? Sounds, sounds good. 
Yeah, Doc, that sounds great. That, and I'm being sensitive to their timing. Yes. I'm also asking for a commitment. It doesn't mean they're going to be 100% committed, but but they're likely, and we know from Robert Cialdini, um, you know, the world authority on influence, uh, that when people commit to something, they're more likely to follow through with it. Um, so, George, I like your your, uh, your 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 faithfulness, your loyalty to uh, show up every six months and give me a chance to, to keep an eye on things. Uh, I can give you a status report. If things start to go south, I can let you know. Uh, and we're just, we'll be ready when you are. And what we found is that that is, that lands so well on your patients. Because instead of them hearing all or nothing, right. you, know, you never present all or nothing. You never present all or nothing. I want to be clear about it. I don't believe any of our listeners of the Thriving Nation will present all or nothing. But that's what the patient can hear. And also notice the relationship driven aspect of this. You're tuned into them. You're presenting dental solutions relative to their timing. Timing is a variable in case acceptance. And frankly, it's a variable you don't have control over. You have a lot of control over things, but you don't have control over timing in their life. That can change at the drop of a hat, good or bad. You know, timing can change good or bad. Right. Um, and so now we're addressing that and we're addressing it in a way that gives the patient uh, the feeling of some control. And it tends to land really well with them. One thing I'm going to uh, encourage you to listen for, you might be surprised how many patients will say when you say, is now the right time to address this ideally? You might be surprised how many people will say, yeah, that's why I'm here. Ask the question, though. Ask the question for sure. One more comment before we get to the Q&A segment. Um, one of the things I've noticed uh, in practices that have been fairly consistent across almost all practices, doctor, as you mature and you age, so does your patient base. So does your patient base. Uh, typically, the patient base will mirror the doctor's age plus or minus 10 years. So doctor, if you're 60, the sweet spot of your patient base are typically between 50 and 70. And that simply happens because of social circles and referrals and all kinds of things that contribute to that. There's exceptions, of course, but that's the common thing. So as you age, if doing more complex restorative dentistry is something you're interested in, the first thing you have to have is those skills on the shelf. Um, and you've got to be able to provide those. You know, you're not going to present it confidently if you can't, uh, if you're not confident of your clinical skills. Um, there's lots of places to go to learn how to do that. I have a bias. I'm going to share my bias right now. Um, I think one of the great places to go to learn how to do complex restorative dentistry is the Panky Institute. Uh, just go to panky.org. There are others, and I'm going to give credit to some others. Uh, I think the world of what uh, Spear Education does, Frank Spear and Spear Education is very good. Uh, I also think uh, the world of uh, what John Coyce uh, does uh, in the Coyce Center, K-O-I-S Center, another great place to go. Um, but, uh, Hey, if you haven't been down to the Panky Institute, uh, come down to Key Biscayne, Florida and learn how to do complex restorative dentistry. Dentists from all over the world, uh, come to learn how to do complex restorative dentistry. And that might be something you want to add to your skill set. Um, quick little story as I wrap this up, a uh, long time client of mine's now retired, but, uh, as he got into his late fifties, he said, Gary, there's, there's so many patients I have in my practice that have much more complex needs. And typically I just haven't done that in the practice. Uh, do you think it'd be worthwhile for me at this stage in my career um, to learn how to do those skills? Uh, he was 57 at the time. And I said, yeah, absolutely. How long do you plan to practice? Well, you know, if I'm healthy, I'd like to practice at least another 10 years and, and maybe longer. Um, I said, yeah, you've got plenty of runway to do that. Go down to the Panky Institute. Anyway, he went down to the Peg Institute, took the essentials courses, each one's a week long. And after going through the four essentials courses, was really skilled at adding complex restorative dentistry. And he spent the remaining time in his practice doing a fair amount of that because a lot of these patients had been coming to him for years and they wanted to have this done before he retired. Um, he ended up retiring uh, at 70 years old. Uh, 13 years later, after he started that journey with the Banking Institute. But in that last 13 years, he ended up doing a bunch of complex restorative dentistry. Eh, I hope that's encouraging. It's something for you to think about. Naren, we've got some great questions teed up in the, in the Q&A segment. Let's hit pause here. 
in the coaching and action segment and get to those, uh, those, that Q and a segment. Gary, thank you very much for the coaching and action segment, a wonderful, wonderful topic as always an effective way to increase your case acceptance of ideal care an effective way to increase your case acceptance of ideal care. This is Naren again, your co-host, and I have four questions for you, Gary. Let me start with question number one. In your experience, do more complex cases come from existing patients who are now ready for ideal, or do they come from new patients specifically seeking ideal care? All right. Um, it, it, when I saw that question, I had to do some research uh, because I didn't immediately know the answer to that question. Uh, I, I had a perception at Life Smiles, what happens, but I wanted to uh, extend it across a broader uh, a broader universe. So I looked at our client base and we have clients in all 50 states. So I looked at our client base and I got some data from, from uh, my client base. And what I discovered was really interesting. What we discovered across the client base is it's about a 50-50 split. About 50% come from existing patients where you have presented treatment and they're percolating it. They're, they're percolating it along. And then there comes a time where now they're ready. About 50% comes from that. Um, and the other 50% comes from new patients who are specifically seeking out whatever that ideal care is, whatever they're seeking that. In other words, they're looking for a dental office to provide that. About a 50-50 split. Um, but one thing I would say that might be a little bit more unique about my client base is my client base tends to be pretty sophisticated when it comes to marketing. So they are doing things in marketing to attract not just people and not just new patients, but attract the right type of new patients. And they're doing that primarily through search engine optimization, SEO, organic search engine optimization. In other words, where they're not paying Google in the form of pay-per-click, but they are earning a ranking on page one by mastering digital marketing so that we are, uh, my client officers are showing up on page one when someone in their community is looking for ideal complex restorative dentistry. Um, it's about 50-50. Um, and I think it's kind of cool mix, frankly. The 50% that are existing patients, it's, they're just, it's a matter of waiting for the right timing. And that's outside of our control. But if we keep them engaged in the practice, keep them committed to their hygiene appointments, then there's no question about who's going to do that dentistry. You're, you're going to do it. But it, now it's a matter of timing. And the other half is coming, seeking that out. Um, and I think the best way to create that kind of mix in your own practice is to get serious about digital marketing. Um You'll cover the first part if you simply follow my recommendation in the coaching and action segment, which is ask that question, is now the right time in your life? In light of whatever reason you know that, that might be in the way, in light of you recently having moved, is now the right time to address this ideally? And if they say not quite, then we get them enrolled in hygiene, get them committed in hygiene, and then we see them every six months, and then when they're ready, you'll, you'll be ready. But the other part of that is mastering digital marketing to get more patients that are seeking out that kind of care. Um, you know, a, a patient doesn't have the same value. I don't mean that humanistically. I think every person has value, but a patient doesn't have the same value. Naren is a toothache, the same value as full mouth restorative dentistry. No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. So start marketing to attract whatever, whatever your version of complex restorative care is, whatever the flavors are that you offer, it might involve TMG, it might involve TMD, it might involve TMJ, uh, it might involve complex restorative dentistry, it might involve adult orthodontics. Um, there's a lot of different uh, flavors. And if you'd like to learn more about how our clients are doing that, uh, I would encourage you to schedule a marketing strategy meeting with, with Equa, Equa, the agency that does our marketing and does most of the marketing for my clients, um, you'll see that same result. Uh, go to equa.com forward slash MSM and, and learn how you can start attracting more of those kind of patients that are seeking out 
really the full range of services that you can provide makes a big difference in your practice. You know, recently, uh, Aaron, in fact, it was literally today, um, one of my clients had a record month. And it was a record month, not by a few bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a record month by 25% over his previous record month in production. This is solo doctor practice, big, strong practice. But it, it was a new record by 25%. And I asked the obvious question. I said, my goodness, what did you do in this month? He goes, I know, Gary, I, I, I'm shocked. So I didn't know I could do that. Um, and I said, I, I think I know the answer, but I don't want to assume it. What'd you do? He said, Gary, it was all about case mix. I did more, I did, I did more complex restorative dentistry that month than I've ever done. In a Makes sense. Worked the same hours I've always worked, you know, worked the same number of days, but I ended up being a lot more productive because I did more of the kind of dentistry I wanted to do. And he said, and man, uh, I kind of had the feeling like after a good, uh, like you go to the gym, you know, do a good workout, you feel kind of tired, but it's kind of a good tired. Yes. He said, I felt like I worked this month, but it was a good feeling. It was like, not like, you know, stick a fork in me. I'm done. He said, I, I've had months where I've, I've, I've not even come close to meeting goal. And, and I feel like, you know, stick a fork in me. I'm done because it was all single tooth dentistry. And I said, well, what's the takeaway? Um, and uh, he said, let's do more complex dentistry. I said, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll second that motion. So there you go. Thank you. Yeah, if anybody's interested in learning more about marketing and how do you attract these new patients who are specifically looking for ideal care, you know, book that marketing strategy meeting, equa.com slash MSM, uh, ekwa.com slash MSM. And uh, our team will spend a lot of hours prior to the meeting getting ready and share both where you stand and kind of give you a roadmap on how to succeed. Uh, once again, it's ekwa.com slash MSM. Those, there's patients out there that can benefit from your best. Uh, right. We just have to find them, you know, and have to find them and, and give them a reason to choose your office. And Equ was a master at doing both those things. Thank you, Gary. Let me ask question number two. I have many patients who are now retired and no longer have dental insurance. Many of these patients could also benefit from complex dentistry. Do you think it might be useful to take a full set of records at no charge for these patients so that we could show them how we could help them? Wow, what a great question. Love, love, love that question. And, and I'm going to just simply answer it um, strongly and say, yes. But let me explain. Okay, so these people are now retired and they don't have insurance. First of all, isn't that awesome? They don't have insurance. That's fantastic. Because now uh, your, your full fee for service, you know, fees on those patients. That's fantastic. Uh, secondly, of course, because they're retired, they're, they're older, and they likely have more complex needs. Um, I would absolutely uh, take whatever records are required. Um, you know, a, a panoramic x-ray. Uh, I, I would take um, a, C, a, a, a cone beam, a digital C, a CBCT. Uh, I would uh, scan, uh, you know, take whatever images you can take. Uh, of course, photography as well. And remember, if, they're, if they no longer have insurance, they don't have insurance that's going to cover the x-rays. Would I be willing to give that away as a courtesy to them? Maybe, you know, and I'll, even, I'll explain how I would present that to the patient with the idea that they'd have more knowledge to be able to make good decisions about their health? The answer is yes, absolutely. So, um, and let me share a, a case study of that uh, in my client base. Uh, one of my clients uh, about two years ago uh, purchased uh, a practice that was nearby. Uh, it was a senior doctor. Uh, he didn't really have a practice that you could sell conventionally. His equipment was all worn out. Uh, the lease was done on, on his building. Um, and it was a, a tired old practice. Um, but my, my client did inherit uh, about 500 patients from this retiring dentist practice, paid for it, of course. And many of those patients now had gravitated over to my client's office. And I had to coach my client. Said This was a very conservative retiring dentist. He didn't do much. I said, be careful coming in like a bull in a china shop and immediately saying, you know, George, your mouth is a mess. You need to do, 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 do. 
I said, that's what you're going to see. They need a bunch of stuff. But the previous dentist was probably telling him, you're in okay shape. Uh, we'll just keep an eye on some things. So if you come in like a bull in a china shop, what's going to happen there? Or what's a possibility of something that could happen? Yeah, I think they won't trust him. They think, you know, this guy's uh, not somebody they can trust. It's not consistent. Yeah, yeah. Not consistent with what they believe, what they think. Yeah. So I said, you know, find something that you can do right away. That, you know, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. You're, you're, it's like a kid in a, you're going to be like a kid in a candy shop. Find something you could do that that you could do really well with them and very comfortably for them to let them know you're, you're a, a you know, painless dentist uh, and then start to earn their confidence. Um, after they had been through two recall cycles, two recall cycles, here's what he started to do. He started to say, um, let's say the patient's name is William. Um, William, you know, I can kind of keep patching you up the way your you know, previous dentist done, frankly, the way we've done for you as well. Or there's a lot of things I see going on in your mouth. Um, I could get some records and together you and I could take a look at those and, and with the goal of preventing future problems. And William, I'd be happy to gather those records and do the consultation with you at no charge. There'd be no charge for any of that. Uh, I just want you to have the information that you need so you can make good decisions about your mouth. Is that something that would be of interest to you? And almost everyone, when presented that way, after they had been through two hygiene appointments in this practice, almost everyone said, you do that for me at no cost? Absolutely, William. Um, you know, we'll take the records and I'll sit down with you. We'll go over those together with the idea of uh, solving future problems. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. Um, and and many of those patients started to move forward in their treatment plans of ideal care. Not everyone wanted to do everything at once, of course, but very often they move forward in this. And I think it absolutely makes sense. If you're doing everything digitally, what, how much does it cost you to take? The, what's it cost you to take the CBCT? I'm going to say much, nothing. nothing. Well, let's yeah. assume the CBT is paid for. Right. Uh, it's, now you're going to say, well, wait a minute, my assistant time. No, you're paying your assistant anyway. Take those records. Right. The value, the perceived value to the patient is very strong. You might even say, you know, William, since you're retired um, and you'd have to pay for those records out of pocket, I'll do that for you at no cost. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a great question. That's what I would do. And I would do it post haste. That would be a great thing to do to your practice for sure. And I think this uh, dentist is thinking correctly because a lot of people who are retired do have savings. I mean, usually if you look at where is the money right now, it's in those older people, you know, the young guys can't even afford to buy their own houses, <laughs> you know, leave alone to extra dentistry. Well, I'll tell you, given the choice of a 75 year old new patient or a 25 year old new patient, I'll take the 75 year old every day of the week. <laughs> exactly. For, exactly. Not, you know, for a lot of reasons, um, but not the least of which is, is many of them do have, Resources. They have resources or access to resources where, yeah. um, and, and frankly, um, they want to live, um, they want to be yeah. healthy. Yes. Um, if any of you haven't uh, been introduced to the uh, the writings about the blue zones, the blue zones, right? Um, the blue zones are five areas of the world uh, where there's a disproportionate number of centenarians, centenarians uh, that live in these blue zones. Um the author of uh, Blue, I'm trying to remember his name right now. Um, it's Dan Butner, I believe, Dan Butner. Um, and he's the authority on the Blue Zones. Just look yes, up you're uh, correct. Blue Zones. He's Dan, Dan Butner. Butner. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and anyway, there's people that are thinking, you know, at 75, I'm going to be, I'm going to be one of those hundred years. I got another 25 years and you know what? I want to be healthy uh, and I want to be active. Um, and I, and I want to have, I want to be able to eat anything I want to eat and I'm willing to, to invest in my mouth. Um, great. Uh, I think it's a collision of opportunity, uh, for sure. Thank you, Gary. Let me go to question number two. How often would you suggest revisiting the treatment plan with a complex restorative patient? Oh, good question. Um, I don't think we want to be heavy handed with it. And I don't think we want to like force it down their throat. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing I would always do with the patient that has uh, any unscheduled treatment, I would always make sure you do the exam. 
uh, for them as you come in and do the exam. Anybody that has unscheduled treatment, even if their mouth is healthy, but they have unscheduled treatment, then come in and do the exam and give them a status report. Um, hey, George, you know, we've talked about this. Let me take a look and see how we're doing and revisit it relative to the treatment plan. And you can say, hey, things are holding nicely. We, we're buying some time here. Things are holding. Keep your six-month hygiene appointments. Or conversely, I can say, oh, I'm concerned. I'm starting to see some tooth mobility here where we didn't see it before. So give them a status report. And I would do that every hygiene appointment. So every six months, more frequently, if they're periodontally involved, um, uh, it could be every three or four months. Don't be heavy-handed with it. Just give them a status report. Hey, George, we've talked about this. Let me give you a status report. And it, just tell them the truth. Looks like things are holding nicely. Keep doing mm -hmm. what you're doing. Um, looks like we're buying ourselves some time. Uh, or tell them what you're seeing. They'll appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Let's go to question number four. Have you found any useful financing options for patients who need complex dentistry? Uh, yeah, I, I actually have. Um, and we've sought it out. We've, we've, we've been looking for it. Um, one thing I will share with you, in my experience, not only at Life Smiles, but in my client base, a lot of the people that need complex restorative care have the resources uh, or have access to it. Maybe they have it uh, in the form of home equity. Um, many times they don't need options, uh, mm -hmm. but let's have an option in case they do, in case they do need some financing options. Uh, the option that I'm going to recommend is called Proceed. P-R-O-C-E-E-D. Now, if you'd look up the URL for Proceed, we'll make sure we put that there. Uh, okay. I'll mention it in a minute. Proceed. P-R-O-C-E-E-D. Uh, it is a financing option that's similar to some of the other ones that you may be familiar with. Um, I love Care Credit, for example. Been using Care Credit for years. Um, love Care Credit. I like their 12-month interest-free program where you can offer your patient uh, 12 month interest free. Of course you pay for that in, in the form of a higher discount rate. Uh, I'm happy to offer our patients, you know, 12 months interest free uh, through care credit. But the problem with the 12 month plan is it may not get the payment low enough for patients that need financing to be able to, to do that care. Um, so proceed uh, will go up to 96 months, up to, up to 96 months. They'll also finance up to $80,000. Now, an $80,000 case is crazy. You know, that isn't something that is in, you know, many practices uh, experience base. But they'll finance specifically for dentistry up to $80,000. I believe the minimum they'll finance is $3,500. So $3,500 on the low side up to $80,000. And they'll go up to 96 months. And so that 96 months will allow you to bring the payment down. Let's say it's a $30,000 case. I'm just picking a number, Naren, to give an example. Let's say it's a $30,000 case. Now they can go up to 96 months. Uh, there's no prepayment penalties. If they want to pay it off early, they can. But that'll bring the payment down to something that might be like a car payment. You know, it might end up being like a $250 a month payment. And for a lot of people, I'm not saying $250 a month is jump change, but for a lot of people, it's like, no, I can work that into my budget. Um, it, so it is a shared risk program or a, a shared risk. Let me explain. It's non-recourse. If you grant the loan, it's non-recourse, but it's shared risk. What I mean by that is the interest rate and the discount rate is variable based on the patient's credit worthiness. So if the patient has very good credit rating or very good credit score, the interest rate the patient pays is lower and the discount rate you pay is lower. If the patient's um, credit score is lower, then the patient will pay a higher interest rate and you pay a higher discount rate. Now you get to decide. There may be a threshold where you say, I'm not willing to pay any more than this discount rate. And then you get to decide that. But it's a very useful financing program for those bigger cases uh, very, because it'll go up to 96 months and I'll bring that payment down uh, to what for a lot of people might be a typical car payment. A lot of people are like, well, I can do that. Yeah, you know, I'd be in good shape. Naren, what's the URL for Proceed? Proceed Finance. Proceed. Yeah, ProceedFinance.com. Proceed yeah, uh, P-R-O-C-E-E-D Finance.com. Uh, no affiliation. We've just found them to be very useful. We have no affiliation with them, um, but very, very useful. Um, take a look at it. And now you'll have a, 
another arrow in your quiver uh, if someone that needs complex care needs a way to finance it and a great way for you to do that uh, for sure. Um, so there we go. Uh, great quote. We had especially good questions this episode, Naren. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Gary. Yeah, it's uh, great questions. And I think, um, like you said, complex just complex dentistry is a great way to grow your practice. We work with hundreds of practices and I know the ones who are making the most amount of profit, uh, more than revenue, focus on complex dentistry. Well, and also, um, you know, the, the, the truth is any kind of dentistry we do could be life changing, mm -hmm. but fillings typically aren't life changing. Now, I don't mean to be cynical, but the fillings aren't usually life changing. However, I mean, it could be if they were in pain or whatever, but not usually. But when right. you do complex restorative dentistry, the likelihood that that is life changing dentistry is really good. And you, you get much more gratitude out of doing that uh, for sure. Uh, and much more gratitude from the patient and internal gratitude uh, of really being able to use your skills to help people uh, with more complex problems. <laughs> Excuse me. On that note, um, I want to thank you, Naren, for uh, being a co-host of this podcast. Thanks for all the cool work you do at Equa and your team does to uh, provide uh, complex restorative patients to offices that would like to do that flavor of dentistry. And also want to thank all of our listeners. We appreciate each and every one of you here at The Thriving Dentist Show. If you haven't done it already, I have a request for you. Um, go to iTunes and write us a review. Just type in uh, Thriving Dentist Show and write us a review. Uh, that operates for us the same way that, say, a Google review works for you, helps more dentists find us, the way that a Google review helps more patients find you. If you haven't done it, we'd appreciate that. Uh, let me thank you in advance for that. On that note, uh, thank you for the privilege of your time. Naren and I look forward to connecting with you on the next Thriving Dentist Show.